And I also, I mean, I teach serious games at in the graduate school at DePaul University here in Chicago. And um, I've been doing this for a while. Um, so, uh, but the, um, the premise of, of this talk is uh, kind of like a, um, it, it'll get, it's start out easy and then it'll get harder and that's the way learning should be. <laughs> We're gonna talk about non-immersive and immersive virtual uh, learning platforms, but we're going to concentrate on why multi-sensory learning is so important in medical training and assessment. Uh, number two is, uh, uh, and we're going to kind of go through some of the, the technology that um, is available, but more importantly, I'm going to talk about the who, why's, and where, and how much why does this cost money and uh, how much does it cost and what can we do and how can we make our education better so that's that's kind of like an overview and i'm uh and by the way please put your questions in the chat window i'd be happy to address them uh, as we go um because we're a small group and we can do that so um one of the things that um uh, that's important is this is not me speaking. Uh, when I do research, um, I follow uh, uh, the old adage that if you see seen further, it's because you stood on the shoulders of giants. And so this is going to be an accumulation of, of, of little bits and pieces of things. And there is a link to everything that I have here. So any research paper, any, any documentation is there so you can go back afterwards and look at the um, whole thing. So let me just, so we're gonna talk about why virtual reality and augmented reality are such big deals. So hold on. Virtual reality is what we believe will be the next generation computing platform along with augmented reality. And the difference between the two is virtual reality, you wear a head mounted display and it completely blocks your field of view so you can't see through it. Whereas augmented reality, it's like wearing a pair of glasses and you'll be able to look through and see the environment around you with a display highlighting whatever images it's going to project to you. By 2025, we see this market approaching $80 billion, or about the size of the desktop market today. But while today virtual reality is primarily thought of as a place for hardcore gamers to spend their spare time, it's increasingly impacting sectors that people touch every day. For example, it's being used in medical institutions, at hospitals to train doctors, uh, to teach them how to be better surgeons. It's transforming the ability for educational institutions uh, to go on a field trip and to be able to experience the Great Wall of China firsthand without having to take a trip. Uh, what happened here? How did that? How did that possibly happen? Hold on one second. So now that's that's kind of uh, what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at some videos that I've uh, accumulated that talk about why this is important. And if you think about um, new technology that's going to replace the desktop computer tech, um, tech te technology in terms of sales, we're talking about a major deal. So th this is really important that um, that we at least pay attention to. And as I mentioned in the beginning, multi-sensory learning is the key to creating multiple synapses in the brain that transfers short-term information to long-term memory and recall. And um, the paper that I took this information from is linked here. But we're going to talk about and we're going to see some examples of environments where not only do you use auditory and vision, but taste and smell and also haptic responses, so and touch. And these are all things that provide us with the 
a sense of reality that um, increases our awareness and um, our attention. And those are, those are key ingredients in the learning process. The, um, uh, this is just a, a kind of, there's a link here to uh, uh, research on the effects of, on child's performances, but this is, you've seen this, uh, uh, this pyramid before, and you can see at the bottom where when you do something and you have experiential learning, in medicine, uh, it's uh, see one, do one, teach one. And uh, because I've done a lot of education, surgical uh, residency programs, um, so, and, and they've used that mantra for years. So, but the key is, is that how do you do one over and over and over again? And we could, we could take the um, kind of, um, we could take baseball as an example. Um, baseball, you've never seen a relief pitcher go out onto the mound without a warm up. They just, they don't do it. You also see baseball hitters. They have pitching, they have practice to perfect, to do this over and over again. The key is, is that you want to have what we call in medicine a cognitive warm up. So if you can review the procedure very quickly on your phone, on your mobile device, on your tablet, on your computer before you actually have to do it, or it might even be available to you in your glasses so that you have your checklist in front of you and I'll show you examples of those things. So let's, let's move on, but we're really interested in this bottom the very bottom base of how we learn is experiential learning. So where does this experiential learning, and where do we get all this from? Well, we, we get it from a variety of places, but the, one of the most successful is flight training. Flight simulators have been around since actually World War uh, II, and um, they weren't computer-based, but they were, there were simulators. They try to create. The, you don't see a pilot, a commercial pilot, in an airline, airplane that trains in an empty plane. They just can't afford to do that. They train in every kind of environment on a simulation. simulation. And so if we can take this particular um, environment, and which has been proven over and over again to be successful, and apply that to medicine or just about any training environment, we then get a much better um, uh, feeling of how uh, we can apply experiential learning to our uh, to these environments. So let's quickly run up and get involved in immersive VR. And so I, first of all, before I get there, I'm going to show you a little bit of a uh, surgical procedure that was done at uh, University Hospital's Cleveland Clinic in, in Cleveland. And this is how they, they did a fly-through of um, a brain aneurysm and trained their instructors with it. This is using the HoloLens from uh, Microsoft. but um, these people, surgical theater, have actually created an entire environment. Let me go back here, and um, that, as the as the woman in the first video talked about, is that you are um, totally immersed in this environment. You don't see anything else. You hear exactly what is needed to be seen, so that your attention is captured by this environment. This is fabulous. The problem is, and I, and I will show you a little later in this, uh, in this program, I have developed a, um, a 3D simulation for teaching opiate addiction to nurse anesthetists. And I have, the program is for 52,000 nurse anesthetists. We can't provide them with a $3,500 Allo lens headset. 
every one of these to use it. So there has to be kind of another way of doing this, but we're going to get to it. So if you have any question, um, um, uh, just let me know, okay? And I will um, uh, address them as we go. So, so here, here is a problem that it has been, that came up since, it's actually ever since people have gone to war. They have, and, but it's more prevalent today because we know what it's called, we know what it's called before it is depression. Now we know it's post-traumatic stress disorder. And we have soldiers in theater coming back with, um, with post, um, with PTSD. So let me just show you a little bit of a, uh, a video of this and why you might have PTSD. Anybody who's ever been in combat remembers it like it was yesterday. There is nothing like it. And so when, so there are some people at uh, University of Southern California who have developed some programs for treating PTSD. And let me just show you what that looks like, okay? demanding challenges a human being can experience, even for the best prepared military personnel. These reports say that one in five Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have been diagnosed with some level of post-traumatic stress. Brave Mind is a form of virtual reality exposure therapy that combines video game-based simulations with one of the most widely used evidence-based therapies. Making use of the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies, expertise in immersive technologies, and emotional storytelling, Brave Mind is a treatment option with appeal for today's digital generation. Brave Mind gradually recreates trauma-relevant scenarios that clinicians can use to help patients confront and process difficult memories in a safe and supportive environment. More than just sights and sounds, Brave Mind uses a virtual reality head-mounted display, directional 3D audio, vibrations, and smells to generate a truly immersive recreation of the event that can be regulated at a pace the patient can handle. Unbelievable. And once you, you're in this environment, it, it's a powerful learning experience. And it's, um, it's used today, and the research is really terrific. By the way, um, you can click on this link to get that research. Let me go back. There's also a paper a link to a paper that is, let me see where it was. This paper here, this research was done by Skip Rizzo and others, and they, they really talk about clinical virtual reality. And this is just published, this, this link, and you can go to it and get this, this research in this particular area. Very, very powerful research. So, Again, I'm coming back to who, why, when, how, and how much. And um, so here is another program that is going to, um, going to make tremendous inroads in education. It's called natural language acquisition. So I'm going to show you this. Hello. Hello, doctor. I'm Dr. Cole. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. What brings you in today? My ear really hurts. That's why I'm here. Tell me more. Well, it started about three days ago and was just irritating. At first I thought it would pass on its own, but the ear pain just kept increasing. That's when I started taking Martrin. I see. 
It's getting hard to sleep now because the left side of my face is starting to hurt too from it. The medicine I took isn't working anymore. I'm sorry to hear that. Thanks, doctor. I appreciate that. When did this start? This started three days ago. And hold on one second. Let me. So here is a situation where you get to practice with a patient as many times as you want. And this, this particular program not only requires that you as the surgeon or the doctor um, come up with the questions in your own mind and order the questions by um, hierarchy of, of needs, but also what's so important is that the results, um, when we do research, we want, we want to um, come up with reliable or efficacy of the questions or the, the person. When standardized patient training, they're actors. And it's hard to get all of our medical students or our surgical residents to interview the same surgical patients so we can identify whether they've asked the right questions or in what order or how they responded to it. By having a virtual patient, we get that kind of information and could do studies that are much more um, reliable in terms of what questions they ask, how to interview a patient. We also get to record their, um, the uh, interviewers, the doctors, facial expressions and things like that, tone of voice, so that we can accumulate a lot of information about how they deal with their patients. This is really critical. And, um, and you, as you know, Siri and uh, Alexa are becoming more important. Um, um, there was a new program, uh, Google, I forgot what it was called, uh, Google, where it actually used AI. And um, it was just unbelievable in terms of asking questions um, that um, in, in interviews. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll put the link in, OK? So um, this is something that you're going to find more and more in, uh, in training for medical situations. So now we kind of talked about um, uh, immersive environments. We want to get an introduction to non-inversive AI. And this is. Uh, very, very important. Here is a program that was created for the Veterans Administration by people in Orlando called uh, Creative Veterans. Very interesting group of people. In fact, I'm um, talking to them now about doing the project. But um, let me let me just show you what it does, and then I will. Uh, here it is. So this is a, a game-like environment where you actually have to do things to patients and you um, get the responses and um, you literally know where to um, uh, learn how to, uh, to actually practice certain procedures on the patient that happened to be in, in anesthesia. Let me, um, let me just show you something. Hold on one second. These are, by the way, the full videos are available on those links. So let me whoop. So let me go to the to something that I have done, and you, you might get an idea as to uh, uh, the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists came to us and said we need something that teaches opiate addiction uh, treatment. And how are we going to do this? And so I uh, and my team uh, created this program of three different patients that are um, either a risk of opiate addiction, are in have an opiate addiction, 
and also not only have opioid addiction, but other addictions. So um, let me just show you a quick little video of how interactive these can be. If I can find it, here it is. Hello, Mr. Anderson. How are you today? I'm in a lot of pain. Please tell me more about the pain. It was a car accident one and a half years ago. Since then, I've had back, shoulder, and neck pain. Nothing works for my pain. Given that Mr. Anderson has had pain for a long time, please check the PDMP for other prescriptions. The urine drug screen came back positive for oxycodone, cocaine, benzodiazepines, and morphine. So here is a program that allows you as a nurse anesthetist to actually assess the patient exactly as you would in, in your environment. You have all the tools available to you. You have to make a full assessment of what the, the, the and, and we didn't spend a lot of time interviewing the patient or doing some of the other things or checking the medical record, but um, this gives you, um, as the anesthetist, a, um, a, 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 an environment where you literally go in and do a complete assessment and patient history, and then you're required to um, have a, 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 a plan, a medical plan for them, and then actually execute the plan and then get feedback on everything that you've done. It provides you with resources from the CDC, um, how to calculate the uh, methane uh, measurement, uh, all different kinds of things, uh, morphine equivalent. Um, it, it's just um, so, and it's been, it's been on the market since uh, March 1st and very well received. So I just thought I'd let you know that now here's an environment that even though the environment was created in a 3D environment, it still doesn't require a headset to use. So um, uh, I just thought I'd let you know. Here is what other people have talked about, what AR is all about. And this is something that is going to be so exciting to all of us um, because it provides us an environment to put things in a place. Let me just show you this little video. I'm sure you, you may have seen it. Uh, We've been teaching human anatomy the same way for a hundred years. Students get a cadaver, then they look at medical illustrations and it's completely two-dimensional, and the human body isn't. Microsoft HoloLens is a holographic computer that you wear. Well, it enables you to bring your so you digital world into your real world. And, uh, by creating simulations with the HoloLens, that lets them have an experience where they can... Isn't that interesting? Here, we've, ever since the beginning, since kindergarten, or when, you know, you made a mistake, you failed how bad it is. And here we want to create environments where you actually do something and um, 
you, uh, and you can fail and learn from it. And that's how we learn. We reflect on what we've done. So um, this is very, very powerful uh, uh, learning environments. Let me go to another one to let you know what, what is really uh, um, critical. Just recently, I had a complete physical. And um, I happened to have a new doctor. And he interviewed me, but he looked at the computer the whole time. I um, um, and so for an hour, I I uh, I spent looking at him or, or looking, and while he was looking at the computer. So here is a new program that's really exciting. The most rewarding part of being a primary care physician is the relationship that we have with our patients. Yeah. You'll get through this. It really. It really touched me. Glass, can you pull up the healthcare maintenance for Micah? I see that you're overdue for a couple blood tests. Nothing that's new. Glass allows us to stay in the moment. You tend to feel a little, I'm going to be a little nauseous. It clicked with me when she wasn't sitting at the computer all time. No sign of symptoms. She was really able to look me in the eye. And that made it a lot easier for us to interact. How fabulous is that? These are really wonderful tools that are making our medical environment so much more inviting. Uh, it's, and the other thing is, is that you can ask for information and get it promptly and still maintain contact with the, the patient. Unbelievable kinds of uh, environments that are going to be available for everybody. So here's another environment is, is how do you make a young doctor understand what it's really like to be um, 74? So let me just show you uh, this one, if I can find it. Here it is. Here, put on this headset. We're going to start this experience, and you're going to become Alfred for the next seven minutes. Where Alfred is an empathy training exercise. Right now in the U.S., we've got this huge group of people over age 65 that's just going to continue to grow really quickly. There's a huge need for students to be going into careers that are working with elderly people. Whoa. <laughs> okay, this is weird. Uh oh, my vision's impaired. We wanted something that was as accurate to the experience of somebody discovering that they have an impairment and their family confronting them about it and then them having to go act upon that discovery. What would the implications be when the doctor says, you're going to have this for the rest of your life? Powerful, powerful, powerful um, training tools. This is really uh, important stuff. And it, it's just beginning uh, to come into the market. Here, so how much does some of this stuff cost? That's what I get all the time. Everybody says to me, well, I like what you do, but how much is, how much is it? Can you, how much is the case, you know, create a case for me? How much does that cost? And um, it all depends. <laughs> it depends on a lot of things. So I've given you some examples of what some things cost. Obviously, you can create some very low-cost AR environments using Google Cardboard. Fabulous. It still works. It works in a lot of different educational experiences. doesn't cost a lot of money to have a tool. Almost everybody has a cell phone. And so you can create virtual environments or um, augmented reality environments. Think of what Pokemon did last uh, a year or so ago, took over the whole field. Oculus has a whole slew of things. I'll get to that in a minute. We can talk about um, uh, natural language, and here's some links to some of that. Obviously, um, uh, there's links to the HoloLens. And so I'm going to show you two of these things that are important. 
Oculus has uh, uh, some things that are going. Their uh, headset has dropped in price dramatically, but they have also decided that they want to get into the business of providing a virtual reality venue so that you go to music shows, you go to all different kinds of, uh, of concerts, sporting events, and, um, and see these things in virtual reality. Un it's unbelievable. And then obviously the next step is Oculus TV. And you can see some examples on, uh, on, uh, on the, uh, uh, the link that I provided. So this is a coming area in, uh, in, um, in our, our development of virtual reality environments and what we're going to be using. Can you imagine um, if um, in a couple of years everybody was using these headsets uh, because not only that, they could go to these ven venues or watch television using um, virtual reality. Very, very important. And here is a, a program, I don't know if you know, you know about it, is um, that Amazon has uh, created an environment that is free to use. You can create your own AR environments within this um, uh, uh, software on the cloud, software in the cloud, and you just, you, you, you don't download it, you just use it and create your own AR environments. It's unbelievable. Doesn't cost anything except the if you put the um, you need to put the um, uh, the programs in the Amazon server and you pay the server fees whatever that is which is not a lot of money so the future of this is very very bright and um, I, I'm uh, I'm very enthused about some of these things so let me just show you um, how easy it is or one of the things here's is is the clip from it's just a short little clip so I you know we just made this little thing real quick so just to show you that you can do all kinds of things and it also allows you to use natural language to um, uh, approximate cases so there's all different kinds of things that are available so um, I am now uh, this is who I am um, I uh, avail I will be speaking at this uh, this particular conference and um, would love to meet you and talk to you and and uh, let me just say something about Sue and what this conference does. I go to this conference because three to five hundred of the top people in the country go here and we get to talk to each other and see what the latest stuff is. It's just unbelievable. So and with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Sue and let her uh, take over. Sue, uh, do you have any questions at all, Scott? Yeah, well, the, the mic is off, so uh, if you had a question, um, uh, where are you from, Scott, so I know. Oh, great. Okay, well, um, I'd be happy to talk to you about uh, uh, do you also um, uh, do you create uh, simulations for uh, uh, the nursing programs there? Great. Well, hopefully, maybe one of these days we can share some uh, information. I'd love to see what's what's being done. I have a whole slew of uh, other nursing environments um, that we could talk about uh, that we, we teach. Um, I've done some, a lot of work in the geriatric area, 
and also in nursing home um, treatment for patients.